Hey guys, I rushed through today's edit. If there are any problems, let me know. As always, stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Let's do the show. Stand up. And now, stand up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe. It's time to stand up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, if my head cold isn't actually COVID, will I still be able to smell my leaky gas line? And with spring in the Northern Hemisphere in full bloom, should my grandmother continue her spring ritual of putting on that beer hat and funneling some delicious Pilsner? And now, the podcast host whose perpetual puberty helps keep his appearance youthful and his fart jokes plentiful, Pete Dominic! (laughs) Perpetual puberty, by the way, my band... That's the name of my band. We'll be playing this Thursday at the Lost Horizon in Syracuse. Folks, thank you very much for joining me today. I wonder if the Lost Horizon is even still there. I got to look that up. I hope you're doing okay. This is the Wednesday episode of Stand Up, and I have one of your all-time favorites, if not maybe your all-time favorite, Dr. Aaron Carroll joins me today and for the first time longtime print journalist who was last with the stars and stripes newspaper a over 30 year veteran journalist earl stevens joins me today to talk about the state of journalism and what's wrong with it really excited to have talked to him for the first time i think you're going to enjoy well both those conversations we always love aaron carroll but i'm very excited to introduce you to Earl Stevens as well. Okay, time for the news. I've got a clip show and a whole bunch of headlines to read to you. That's what we all call the last 24. Here's all the news I could find for you on Wednesday, April 27th by about 5 a.m. Went to bed early, got up early to do today's show. Well, it was day 463, or it is today, of the Biden administration. There are now just 197 days until the midterm elections. I think there are 21 days until the Board of Education election here in my town that I'm very active in. Kamala Harris tested positive. The vice president of the United States tested positive for COVID-19 yesterday. The CDC came out with new data. I've got audio from Dr. Fauci on this from the PBS NewsHour that nearly 60 percent of the U.S. population has COVID-19 antibodies due to the past coronavirus infection. Here's that from Judy Woodruff and the PBS NewsHour. I want to start with new data uh, that we are learning about, about how many Americans have been infected with the COVID virus uh, among all Americans. And I think this dates back to February. 60 percent almost had been infected. And among children, 75 percent had been infected. First of all, were you surprised by these numbers? And second of all, does this in your mind change the way there should be an official response to the, to the virus? Well, I wasn't terribly surprised, Judy, because we've been having this virus around now for you know, almost two and a half years. So the idea that if you look at the serology, which is the antibody test in the blood, which determines whether you've been infected or not, is not surprising that you have that proportion of the population. I think it's important for people to realize that because although immunity following infection and recovery does not last indefinitely. It does give a degree, a variable degrees of protection against severe disease if you get reinfected. So if you add up the people who've been infected, plus the people who've been vaccinated and hopefully boosted, you have a rather substantial proportion of the United States population that has some degree of immunity that's residual, either residual from prior infection, or hopefully people who are getting vaccinated and boosted. We know we have 66% of the total population has been vaccinated and about half of them have been boosted. All right, there you go. Interesting analysis from Dr. Fauci on that new data. Uh, That was the PBS NewsHour. Now let's head over to MSNBC, where Katie Turr sat down with the board director for the Environmental Defense Fund and the Hulk, Avengers star Mark Ruffalo, who is also a very vocal climate activist, to talk about their push for the U.S. to do a lot more to complete clean a clean energy future. I was going to say the truth of the matter is, is we have been talking to the Department of Energy already about this. There's a, a big tranche of, tranche of money already put aside to, to start to build out this transition. Uh, manufacturing heat pumps, manufacturing solar panels, manufacturing wind turbines. 
Americans, de uh, developing all of these technologies here in the United States, putting people back to work with those technologies and then exporting those technologies to the European countries who have been reliable, who've been relying on fossil fuels right now and who find themselves in this horrible crunch because of the war. What about nuclear energy? Because that's one of the areas that experts have said that Europe can get off of Vladimir Putin's you know, energy train. They need Vladimir Putin's energy right now to, to power Europe. It's part of the reason why Germany has been um, put in a hard place with the support in Ukraine. Are you also advocating to go nuclear? Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, nuclear is very expensive and it's very dangerous. And it might be, um, you know, a transition for the moment. But at the end of the day, these other technologies, wind, water, sun, geothermal, they're much cheaper. They're much safer. And um, in the long run, they create many more jobs. Um, and we'll see, you know, at the end of the day, it's economics, really. Yeah. And we're going to see that these technologies are, are just much more appropriate for the world we're living in today. Mark Ruffalo on MSNBC yesterday with the Environmental Defense Fund and also saw this from ABC News. The headline is millions must cut water use in drought stricken California. We have tons of listeners out in California, but Southern California's gigantic water supplier has taken the unprecedented step of requiring about six million people to cut their outdoor watering to one day a week as the drought continues to plague the state here is Lindsay Davis of ABC News with a really good statistical analysis of the drought. And this is from the ABC News by the numbers segment. Now to the dangerous mega drought in the American West and a new prediction that the thirst for water is unlikely to be quenched in the near future. We take a look by the numbers for much of the U.S. Southwest. The current drought will last through 2022 and potentially longer, according to a new report by NOAA. In six states, precipitation told totals in the last 20 months are the lowest since at least 1895. Meanwhile, daily average temperatures have been the third highest on record. That combination is causing punishing and unprecedented drought conditions. Right now, more than 93 percent of the West is in a drought and more than half of the region is in an extreme drought. In California, more than 45 percent of the state is now in a so-called exceptional drought, which is the highest level. All told, more than 57 million Americans are currently experiencing drought-like conditions. And for all Americans, NOAA is now predicting the entire country will have warmer than average temperatures through October. Oh, well, that sounds fantastic. Great news. The only thing that made that even slightly tolerable to hear was those statistics was that the fact that the music they were playing at ABC News under that. I think that's the, the music that they play subtly at Epcot Center, where I did my college internship in the summer of 94. That's right. And listen to the music. Listen which is the highest level. All told, more than 57 million Americans are currently... Do you hear it? you hear that? Yeah, they always play that. So they had speakers hidden all over Epcot Center, wherever you walked in the pathways, everywhere outdoors, you would hear that music, and a lot of the indoor places as well. Okay, well, moving on from climate, let's head to Washington, D.C., the United States Senate floor, where we could check in with the great Bernie Sanders, who is doing his Bernie Sanders bit, and I'm here for it. It's funny, yesterday, uh, on Sunday, I was in New York City, and I stopped at a McDonald's and I was talking to one of the guys who worked there and I asked him how much money he made, makes $15 an hour. And then he came back and he said, well, they take out over a dollar in federal taxes. So guy working at McDonald's for 15 bucks an hour probably has a higher tax rate than the second wealthiest person in this country. And that's what happens here in Washington when you're somebody like Mr. Bezos or some other billionaire and you make a lot of campaign contributions and you have an army of accountants and lawyers. There you go. The burn man. Loving it. Loving it. See, McDonald's. I tied it. OK, so let's now go to some very important audio from yesterday. This is the secretary of state. Anthony Blinken was in Washington testifying also at the Senate. And here's the clip that went the most viral. Rand Paul questioning Secretary of State. This was a conversation that I guess comes off as respectful, except for the fact that Rand Paul is just way out of his league. He is playing single A ball and he's talking to a major league brain. 
And a real foul was called, a real penalty flag thrown on Senator Rand Paul when he argued about these former Soviet republics where they used to be part of Russia, somehow as if a justification for why Russia could invade them. That would mean every single country that was a former British or American colony could be subjected to the exact same. Uh, we're part of the Soviet Union. Yes, and I, fir- I firmly disagree with, uh, with, with that proposition. It is the fundamental right of these countries to decide their own future and their own destiny. And I'm not here's, saying here's, it's not, here's but I'm saying that the countries that have been attacked, Georgia and Ukraine, were part of the Soviet Union. And, that does were, not and they Russia were part the right of the Soviet Union since the 1920s. But that does not... <laughs> That does not give Russia the right to attack them. On the no contrary, no one's saying it does. They were, but it they were really liberated has nothing to from do. being part of this uh, empire by force. A moment from yesterday that got a lot of attention, and about that, Ted Lieu, Congressman Ted Lieu, uh, tweeted. A lot of people reacted to it, but he said, "I thought this was interesting." Based on the comments by Senator Rand Paul, I note the following countries were also part of the Soviet Union. And then he lists Armenia, Moldova, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Estonia. Russia does not have the right to them either. All right. Now we're going to digress with the next the the final clips here. But they're still, I think, important. You know, probably that uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy had all of these texts and now audio leaked. And it got worse yesterday when even more audio came out. But this time he is criticizing and bad mouthing other Republicans in the House, the far right extremists talking about their Twitters should be banned. Maybe I don't have all that audio for you, but I do have something I think is really important to the Shakespearean drama playing out in the Republican Party led by Tucker Carlson, who might actually just run for president. Here he is getting basically shanking both Kevin McCarthy and his lieutenant, Elise Stefanik, who replaced Liz Cheney, basically, as in the second in command. This is Tucker basically taking them both out. A lot of people predicting that Kevin McCarthy is toast because of Tucker Carlson's comments last night. That's how powerful he is. Here it is, one minute from the most powerful man in all of political media, according to me. It's Tucker Carlson. Listen how he cleverly uses the word we and not I. I, as if he's somehow a conglomerate, an editorial board, a group of people speaking instead of just himself. Clever trick, Tucker, but I'm on to you. What is it about cable television that completely eliminates people's self-awareness? Maybe NIH should do a study on that. It seems like a legitimate health crisis. Sarcasm without the tone. We're being slightly unfair in that analysis. We do not mean, certainly, to suggest that it's only Democrats who favor censorship for political ends. Republican leaders support it, too. In a phone call reported today by the New York Times, for example, Congressman Kevin McCarthy of California told his close friend Liz Cheney that he hoped the social media companies would censor more conservative Republicans in Congress. Donald Trump, the sitting president, had already been silenced by those companies, but McCarthy wanted the tech oligarchs to do more, to force disobedient lawmakers off the Internet. Quote, quote, can't they take their Twitter accounts away, too? Those are the tape-recorded words of Congressman Kevin McCarthy, a man who in private, turns out, sounds like an MSNBC contributor. And yet, unless conservatives get their act together right away, Kevin McCarthy, or one of his highly liberal allies, like Elise Stefanik, is very likely to be Speaker of the House in January. That would mean we will have a Republican Congress led by a puppet of the Democratic Party. So the next 24, 48 hours is going are going to be really interesting to see what happens, I think, here with Kevin McCarthy, Elise Stefanik and Tucker Carlson promoting the most extreme conspiracy QAnon wing of the Republican Party. Are they now just finally going to take over? It was John Boehner. Then it was Paul Ryan. Kevin McCarthy, no one can stop them. Of course, note also just Tucker's whole performance, just the sarcasm without the tone delivering it that way. And also, he called Kevin McCarthy and Elise Stefanik liberals. That's what he said. All right, let's stay with the MAGA network and go for today's most cringeworthy clip is from Devin Nunez on Fox and Friends, the app that Trump launched to compete with Twitter. It's called Truth. I normally wouldn't say it, much less promote it. But this whole clip, that's exactly what Devin Nunez is doing while he's talking to Brian Kilmeade and Steve Ducey on Fox and Friends. And this is tough to hear because... It's so cringeworthy to hear a man try to beg Devin Nunez, beg these Fox News superstars 
to use the app because it's clearly foundering, according to all the accounts that I've read, at least. And Trump himself apparently isn't even using it. And well, here it is. Today's most cringeworthy clip. We know we're so excited that you're on truth. You're getting followers very, very quickly, but you need to send some truths out if you want to get more followers. You know, we just opened this thing wide up a couple of days ago, actually on Saturday. We moved over to the Rumble cloud system, so we cannot be canceled by any tech tyrants. But also, Brian, you're on truth. We yep. need you to truth. But Ducey, I got to talk to him. So he's got to turn his phone on and click on the app. He's been let in. E- either that or he may be a bot. We're trying to keep the bots off so we <laughs> right. can be a little bit concerned about Ducey's like, legitimacy. <laughs> oh, God. It's, it's so tough to listen to because they're all such douchebags. And by the way, Devin Nunez was on Fox the day before. He was asked if with Maria Bartiromo, he was asked if Trump will go back on Twitter if, if Elon Musk bought it. And he said he really doesn't have... Trump doesn't have an interest in going on Twitter. Twitter right now is nothing but a global PR wire. There's nobody there. We have more engagement in Truth Social than they have. So, okay. Donald Trump told us more than 30,000 lies during his four years in office. And those were just warm up to the big lie that led to a violent attack on our country. But yeah, he's totally not going to come running back to Twitter the second Elon Musk gives him the green light. And, oh, Devin, we just feel sorry for you if you weren't such a colossal piece of shit, writes Adam Parkmenko about that at Today's Big Stuff, which is a highly satisfying email. If you are a progressive politically, I think that Adam Parkmenko and Sam Youngman do a great job with that daily email. That They write things like... It's just all news items, and they write things like note six, a whole bunch of notes. Every single time we get a batch of secret texts or emails, Sean Hannity looks like the most pathetic little shit on the planet. Like, who the fuck says, yes, sir, when texting with Mark fucking Meadows? What a loser. For more, go to the Washington Post, and they link to it. So it's like they're, they they link to serious journalism, but they talk <laughs> in that kind of way and fashion. It's... It's vulgar and hilarious. So, all right, I've recommended it enough. They should be paying me. And by the way, thank you to those of you who do. If you haven't signed up for a subscription to Stand Up, go to StandUpWithPete.com right now. I'm going to have to read a list of new subscribers tomorrow's show because several new folks joining us and hope to see you at tomorrow night's Hangout, Thursday nights at 8 Eastern. Always great to welcome new faces And also, speaking of getting paid, Truebill.com is sponsoring this week's show. You probably have a lot of unwanted subscriptions. Go to Truebill.com, Truebill.com slash Stand Up With Pete. And here's a fun news story for from a local North Carolina television news reporter named John Paul. I don't couldn't find the network. I saw this on Twitter. This is about our friend Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina. Three sources tell our team that U.S. Representative Madison Cawthorn was cited for having a gun at Charlotte Douglas Airport this morning. Now, according to the TSA, a nine millimeter handgun was discovered at checkpoint D. The TSA declined to identify the person, but they say, sources say, three of them, that it was Cawthorn. It's unclear if he'll face any criminal charges for this. A spokesperson for CMPD would not immediately comment. This is not the first time that a gun has been discovered on Cawthorn at an airport, though. We know in February of 2021, TSA found a handgun on Cawthorn's carry-on bag at Asheville Regional Airport. Cawthorn did not face any criminal charges for that incident. Why didn't he face any criminal charges for that incident? I wonder about that. I also wonder if this guy is either that stupid or he's doing it on purpose because it's good press for a guy like him to keep getting in trouble for carrying a gun. Because, I mean, yeah, bending over backwards to imagine how that's people would like that. But some people, I guess, might be attracted to that. The fact that this guy carries guns everywhere he goes, through airports and anywhere else he wants. All right, well, that's all the audio clips. That's the clip show. And now it's time for the headlines and what we like to call the news dump. Today's news dump from the great Pete Coe, who is a little under the weather and yet still did it for us, is a jingle based on a news story out of a zoo in Switzerland where an elephant has become a star attraction for his baffling skills in balancing huge tree trunks on the wall of his cage, or as they call it, enclosure. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Tusker the zoo elephant, looking rough and tough. He's lifting up heavy objects on today's news dump. Yes! That is one talented elephant named Tusker. Sired 13 calves at his previous zoo homes. He is the dad of uh, 13 elephants. Hmm. It's a, he's a bull. Star attraction. Switzerland's Basil Zoo. But not for his fatherhood, for his balancing skills. Beautiful story, Pete. Thanks for the find. All right, now let's get on to more serious and impactful stories, folks. Not that that elephant isn't, but the latest out of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Russia saying it's going to cut gas supplies to Poland and Bulgaria. U.S. diplomats return to Ukraine for the first time since Russia's invasion. Vladimir Putin is defending the Ukraine invasion in a meeting with the head of the U.N. And the I. AEA is reporting that Russia's seizure of Chernobyl was very dangerous. Just a few of the top headlines coming out of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Back to Washington, D.C., where military families are railing against a housing provider. Yesterday, there was testimony at the Senate's permanent subcommittee on investigations about what they said veterans or active duty military, I should say, said was mismanagement, neglect and abuse they suffered in private military housing paid for using defense appropriation funds for service members on base accommodations. Their concerns focused on one of the Army, Air Force, and Navy's largest private housing providers, which range from environmental hazards, including unaddressed mold, to logistical failures leading to delayed repairs. In total, they provide housing on 55 separate separate Army, Navy, and Air Force bases across 26 states with a total of 43,000 on-base homes occupied by roughly 150,000 residents, according to the testimony yesterday and this information. Really interesting story there. Here's one from NPR. This is a hilarious and fascinating, I think, important issue story where a Florida man, an activist in Florida, known for his tongue-in-cheek petitions to local government agencies, has now asked school districts in Florida to ban the Bible. In petitions he sent to public school superintendents across the state, Chaz Stevens is his name, he asked the districts to immediately remove the Bible from the classroom, library, and any instructional material, as he wrote in the documents. He also said, additionally, I seek the banishment of any book that references the Bible. The petitions are citing the new bill signed into law by Republicans Governor Ron DeSantis, which lets parents object to educational materials. That bill came about after some parents complained about sexually explicit books being taught in Florida schools. And guess what? The Bible is a very sexually explicit book. All right, moving on. I think that's an interesting story. Look up Chaz Stevens. The Washington think tank Center for American Progress has a new report out with a list of companies that paid little to no taxes last year. They are AT&T, Dow, American International Group, Charter Communications, General Motors, Ford Motors, MetLife, Chevron, ExxonMobil, and Bank of America. 19 of the biggest companies in the U.S. paying little in federal income tax last year. We heard Senator Bernie Sanders address that earlier on today's show. A federal appeals court has agreed to reconsider a ruling that rejected California's first-in-the-nation ban on for-profit private prisons and immigration detention facilities. Again, a new hearing ordered over California's ban on private prisons. That's an important story. The guy who killed the cop who killed George Floyd, Derek Chauvin, has asked the court to overturn his conviction. Attorneys for the former Minneapolis police officer filed in a court Monday asking for his conviction to be overturned. On what grounds? I don't know. I'm not going into it, but thought I would mention it because it's important. A new report is diving into the data on vital measures of health and social determinants of health is finding that women, and particularly women of color, continue to experience steep pay gaps that many Americans cannot afford childcare and many school districts may be underfunded. This new report says that for many American families, a living wage is out of reach. It's the 2022 County Health Rankings Report, which ABC News is reporting on. All right, a couple more. A major Japanese railway is now powered only by renewable energy. Look at that story up. I want to know everything about this railroad. It's in Tokyo, Shibuya, S-H-I-B-U-A. Look into it. In Singapore, sad news where the government there executed a drug smuggler. Despite concerns over his mental disability, the defense lawyers argued that the Malaysian man should not be executed because he was not fully capable of understanding his actions. He'd been co 
coerced. So that's a terrible story. And speaking of terrible stories, anti-Semitic attacks in New York are at the highest level in decades. Last year, there were 51 assaults across the state, a record since the Anti-Defamation League began compiling such data in 1979. In business news, Tesla shares have sunk, wiped out over $125 billion in value as Elon Musk scored the Twitter deal, if you want to look into that. And that's all of the news I've got for you on today's News Dump. Now time to get to my guest, Dr. Aaron Carroll, journalist Earl Stevens. But remember this week, the show is brought to you not only by... 800 subscribers and if you aren't one please subscribe now because i do this full time five days a week stand up with pete.com but also truebill.com slash stand up with pete you've got all kinds of subscriptions that you forgot about truebill helps you sort them out and save a whole bunch of money definitely check it out if you haven't already truebill.com slash stand up with pete right now okay let's get to dr aaron carroll shall we He is the chief medical officer at Indiana State University, answering directly to the president of the university there. And someday I bet he'll be the president of a university. I bet you can count on it. He is a regular contributor to the New York Times, host of his own award-winning, journalist award-winning YouTube channel. It's Healthcare Triage. You should get his books, Bad Food Bible, and all the three books that debunk medical myths. Myths, so good and such great gifts, by the way. Follow him on Twitter at Aaron E. Carroll. Let's go right now. I wanted to start by your healthcare triage tweet, which was a poll question about your your great videos, which says, we're curious which of the following content do you mainly watch healthcare triage for? Health policy, debunking, research integrity, or other? And the most common answer, 37.9% was debunking. And I feel like... That deserves some unpacking, especially as it results to your latest at the New York Times about we got to get like get along. Like it seems like so much of our society is about like arguing and and winning arguments and slamming. Each- Were you surprised by that answer? Debunking? No. I mean, I think it, I mean, one, it feels like that there's a huge I mean, there's a lot of videos of healthcare triage. And I think a fair number of them probably fall into that category just because. They're things that, that people might think or, or they'll basically we come down and say, yeah, research doesn't support that. So maybe, but no, I don't think you're wrong. I think a lot of a lot of our discourse right now is people want to be right. But actually, if they, I actually think something different now, something more wholesome about debunking your debunking videos, I think, save people a lot of money and a lot of anxiety and stress because they no longer have to believe a thing or buy a thing that doesn't work and is only what do you think about that? That's one way of looking at it. That's what I think is that's my read of it. And that's, yeah. of course, the, the nice read of it. But other people are, uh, you know, get upset if you even if like, you know, if you question that their supplements work or their vitamin D or, you know, whatever else they're doing, uh, they get upset because lots of people are sure that, you know, they're right about their diet or what they're doing. And when they hear otherwise, it, it's it's even if I feel like I'm freeing them from a burden, they don't always see it. Though. Yeah, well, it certainly has been the case for me and so many of uh, my listeners who have heard you over the years because it it makes you you could save a lot of money not buying a bullshit supplement. Well, that's the thing I say all the time is people are like, well, what's the harm? I'm like, cost is a harm. You know, some of these things are not cheap. And if people feel compelled to spend significant amounts of money on something that doesn't work and potentially causes harm, I think that's a problem. One of the things people are still doing a lot of, I think one of the most common things seemingly is taking all the vitamins and eating all the right things they can to, in, you know, support their immune system because someone in their house has a cold or God forbid COVID, but that yeah. doesn't work. Right. No, 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 no. Like, no, what prevents you from getting a cold is don't, don't come into contact with cold. Uh, no, nothing. None of those vitamins or anything ever do that, but that doesn't stop people from trying to make a lot of money by convincing you otherwise. And I, I mean, a lot of people believe that. Okay. So that was the one question about your healthcare triage videos, which continue to just kick ass Hmm. and uh, will continue to win uh, more awards. Uh, How about this? Back in 2015 for the New York Times, you wrote a piece called Trapped in the System, a sick doctor story, which is profoundly personal and impactful. And you just re-upped it because sadly, nothing has changed in the last, what, seven years? You've been writing for the New York Times that long. That's impressive. 
I've been writing since 2014. Wow. It'll be man. like eight years now. In it's fact, it's almost ride. exactly not. I think it was, I started in like April of 2014. So, like, that article was, was about just how difficult it is to get my red meds refilled for my ulcerative colitis. And, like, yeah, I mean, just, I think it was, it was two weeks ago. Uh, I needed to get my meds refilled. Like I'm running out. So I went to go get my labs drawn and I found out while, you know, after registering, after going and sitting there, they were like, your order expired. I'm like, how, how does this expire? I need these labs drawn every three months for the rest of my life. Um, and it was, they couldn't get a hold of the doctor. They couldn't figure it out. They refused to let me write my own orders, which meant that I had to, and they're like, we'll come back tomorrow. And I'm like, I can't come back tomorrow. I have to work. Like I took off this time to come do this. So, I then got a you know a friend because I didn't get in touch with the GI doc that best to write me orders, but I couldn't get in for a couple of days. Then once I got in, I sent a message to the, the the doctor saying like I need to get my meds refilled, and then I got a notice back like we don't want to do, we noticed you haven't been in for appointment in a while, making an appointment first, and I'm like, are you telling me I I can't get my meds now until I and when do you have an appointment? Months from now? Like is this for real? And so. I wound up having to like text my doctor over the weekend and be like, just fill the prescription. And well, there just, are it was just a hassle. It's an unbelievable hassle over and over and over and over again. Is it true that you were selling your ulcer colitis <laughs> drugs on the black market to make a little extra cash? Yeah. Is it? I don't. I don't think anybody wants a black market mercaptopurine. But is no, it true I, that you, no, I'm not. Is it true that you were so angry you shit your pants in a CVS? Um. I don't think I've ever shit my pants in a CVS, but I've shit my pants in many places. Right. And many. that should be its own podcast. I've argued for years, but, but so, oh but, but so there are, there are drugs that, that we're talking, this is not, you know, this is your. Oh, it's an immunosuppressant. No, I mean, this is like an immunosuppressant. Like that's what I need. It's not like there's no other use for this, but because it's an immunosuppressant, they check my, they want to see my labs every three months to make sure I'm not immunosuppressing like cells that I need like white blood cells or red blood cells or something else. So fine. I get that. But it's like, it's such a freaking hassle so, every single time. Do you think there are simple fixes uh, to streamline that system? Yeah. Why? Well, yes. First of all, like why should they ever have to renew that order? Yeah. That order should exist forever. I will need these labs drawn forever. There should, and perhaps there should be some automated system with the doctor being like, Hey, your order is about to expire. Do you need this still? The idea that it's somehow my responsibility to know when it's expiring in order to come through is it's it's why like, I can't fix that. So then what's my job to know it's expiring to go nag like this. That's just silly. And it should be automated in the same way that like, if they're like, okay, look, we can't get it done in time, then just get me enough meds to make it through the idea that they're like automatically, like, no, we're not going to renew your prescription until we see you in the office. I'm like, then you should have told me I need to come into the office like this. It's uh, putting all this responsibility and I know health, like I'm on top right. of it. Right, I know it's like when you're- yeah, Most people are not. So it's like, it, this is just- Yeah. And it's an immunosuppressant. Like I, yeah, I'm i not looking to go off of it. it. What keeps me in check? So it's it's just, it's massively frustrating. And it's just mind boggling to me that it's, it's like that- Are there that drugs- come seven years ago. It's like, this is none of this has got. Are there no. drugs like insulin that if people don't get them for similar reasons yeah. that they're in, they could die? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I guess. And so I assume like people have learned to jump through the hoops. But yeah, it's all it's just some of this is just silly. Like yeah. it just doesn't need to be this way. There's no reason to like hold me back. I'm not trying to screw the system. I'm absolutely trying to do the right thing here. And it's still impossible. Uh, in case you just joined us, we're talking to Marxist Welby. Marxist Welby, MD. Marxist. That's still my favorite, like uh, nasty cop. Uh, someone someone else me wrote, Marxist. It's so it's so good. Marxist, Marxist well BMD. Well B is very back, when we were talk, back when we were doing like healthcare reform stuff. Is that not sure. that long ago that right. you were called that? Uh, oh yeah. Like oh yeah, it was definitely something with the ACA or something like that. Marxist <laughs> well BMD. <laughs> Glorious. I mean, that's about, really that's another like, that's mean great. comment that you shared with every article by Aaron E. Carroll. I praise the skies. He's not my doctor. Uh that, comes yeah, that was from, my favorite comment from this last column. Yeah, that, oh yeah, that, that's, that's from this last column. That came from okay, one, of, yeah. one of Dr. Oz's patients. <laughs> so. It'd be impressive if it was. I, have, I don't know that, but All it right. was... Uh, Let's, you know, when you when you just log in to look and see, like, well, what's the reception? And that's, like, the first <laughs> comment you see. It's like, oh, good. Okay, good. 
So your recent piece at the New York Times is titled, We Politicize Masks, Now What? Let's get into it by way of your reaction to the federal judge that uh, repealed the mask mandate on, on what, transportation? This thing that happened last week, I was kind of off, not paying that close attention. But what, what was your reaction to that judge's decision? Well, it, like this is one of those that it's a bad way for the mandate to go down because it sort of sets a precedent that can limit the CDC's you know, statutory authority for matters of safety. And it's even if this winds its way up to the Supreme Court, that could absolutely limit the CDC's statutory authority. Um, And they're sort of caught in this bind because they have been signaling themselves that, you know, the scientific evidence, the need for that mandate is dwindling. Like it was a debate of are they going to continue it? And then they put a date on it. They said, okay, till May 3rd, which is not that far away. And They don't have hard outs like people don't understand when will this go? What's the criteria? And when things become difficult to defend, that's when they become vulnerable. Uh, And I think that they're stuck in a quandary now because I don't think they want to fight for the masks. They just want to fight for their ability to decide whether we need to wear masks. And threading that needle is going to be very difficult. Uh, And so it's I'm sure they're very upset that the mandate went down this way. I don't know that they're all probably very upset that the mandate is going away. Uh, And it's just, it's an unfortunate political and public health uh, mechanism because, because they need to retain their authority. The, the big question is where we're at right now. And and you write in this piece, the pandemic is not over. This pandemic is not over. A new variant could emerge at any time in cases are rising in some parts of the country. Too many people are according to the CDC still at risk. And this judge's ruling may argue that the organization has exceeded statutory authority, but that doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. I guess we just kind of you just kind of uh, commented on yeah, that. Yeah, and so, I mean, it, it, you know, what, if if things get worse again and they need to re up the mandate, it's going to be harder now because like it's, it'll be a war in the courts and stuff. So it's just like th- there's a difference between defending it when there's clearly a need and defending it and looking like you're overstepping and they sort of wandered into the latter. At the um, but that could hamper their ability to to do it when it's needed, which is sad. Uh, what, so so what are the policies that you think we really need well, to be enforcing uh, a, 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 as it, as governments? It's just so frustrating because, like, we have, like, wars over masks. And like I said, it's like we're quibbling at the edges here. Like, the necessity for a mask mandate right now Maybe in some parts of the country for some people, but it's not like it's super clear that it should be like the thing. And it's the thing we're arguing about. And there are things that would make so much more of a difference that, you know, we're not talking about at all. Ventilation. Huge difference. I mean, planes are really safe because of ventilation. The dangerous time on planes is like before takeoff and after landing when they turn off the ventilation and probably getting on and off the plane in the airport, they could talk about masking, but it's like, but we don't do that where we just are like, we don't, we don't say, well, airplanes have such great ventilation. Let's turn the ventilation earlier. Let's make sure that buildings have that and schools and restaurants and workplace. That would be much, much safer. Uh, You could, you know, better finding more innovative ways to get vaccination out there. Something I think we talked about previously, how hard it is to get treatment Fix the disparities, make that so much easier uh, so that people can get to it. Better sick leave policies so that people don't feel like they'll lose their job or lose money if they go to work sick or if they, I'm sorry, if they stay home, if they stay home. So then they go to work. I mean, those are things that would make a huge difference. No one's going to quibble with their effectiveness. You know, they may not always be popular or cheap, but they work. Um, And instead, uh, we just keep fighting about masks. And every day that we're, you know, we're fighting each other and not fighting the pandemic. You know, as I said at the end of the article, everybody loses. Uh, so and for that, for that, somebody was super thankful that I'm not their physician. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, so, like, when I saw that tweet, I was like, man, you are missing out. Not only it, he's like one of my best friends in the world. So I get to ask him like so much stuff. And if he's in a good mood he will give me the worst possible answer. <laughs> he has yes, diagnosed yes. me. At one point, you died. When I told you one of my maladies, you diagnosed me with all of the diseases, yeah, I think. 
I think you you com- you made a word and had, had all. No, of it was a Patton Oswalt thing. I think I said you had cancer of the AIDS of the eye. It's I think that Patton was it. Oswald yes, thing. cancer of the AIDS of the eye. I was like, I think I have poison I ivy. I wish I could remember what bit it was, but that's definitely from Patton. Oswalt. I was like, is th- I texted you? I was like, is this poison ivy? You're like, no, that's multiple cancer, <laughs> AIDS, <laughs> and COVID probably. Uh, I wish I, I got to figure out which bit that was. Yeah, uh, so funny. So. But what about testing and vaccination? I mean, that seemed to be where y- you and many others, the, the drum you were beating, th- those systems being in place uh, and, and more robust. Well, I mean, it's like testing and look, testing is necessary, but, you know, testing is not the problem at the moment. I mean, we're talking about how do we do broad based policy decisions? I think what gets me is that we just keep leaning so heavily on the stuff that individuals need or should do. Um, and we are unwilling to lean on the stuff that maybe society or the government should do. For oh, right. Us. Like, well, like do that's... some freaking policy. Instead, it's like, let's yell at each other. Get us each about masks or you're not testing enough or you're not doing this or you're not doing that. Instead of like, you know, if you fix the ventilation everywhere, everybody's going to be safe, period. And it's like that. It shouldn't be controversial. And yet it is. Uh, yep. And I, I I don't know. I'm just I, I despair sometimes on just how we don't seem to have much of a can do attitude. It's like, we just, we just like, man, I don't how much want, do you I think, how yeah. much of it, of it do you think, how much of an issue do you think it's become in the mainstream that there's been a law, a, a certain lack of credibility or trust amongst experts in general, much less physicians and scientists uh, specifically as it relates to, to COVID, whether that's merited or not. I, I, I I don't know. I don't know. It's like it's because I don't there. I'm I'm cynical enough that I don't think all of this is new. Uh, we could have found big disagreements and all kinds of stuff in medicine for a long time. There have been vaccine deniers amongst medical professionals since there have been vaccines. Uh, it's a little more easy to hear bad information. It feels like now because uh, of social media, like you can find experts. They have louder megaphones. Uh, but this kind of stuff always exists. And when we did our our um, our series, I think, it was in the last year on vaccination. Like, I was shocked when we were looking at sort of the history of the yeah. anti-vaccine movements. Like, it's been physicians from day one. Like, you know, they're always sort of against this kind of stuff. So it's, I don't, I, I don't know that it's new. I just feel like it's louder and it's easier to find. How bad is it right now for, say, like young kids who, who still can't get vaccinated? I don't think there's any under five right now or the immunocompromised. How much danger are they are they in? Because Those are of two separate groups. That's the thing. It's like right. I'd say immunocompromised people are adults who are just not. Yeah. Who are not vaccinated are still at like risk. Like you get covid like the numbers haven't changed. You could. You could get seriously ill. You could die. Um, kids in general are not in the same boat. Uh, you know, the, the numbers in hospitalizations, for instance, New York, I was looking at like kids are, I think, even lower than, un, you know, unvaccinated, you know, or some other groups. It's just or I think maybe lower even than vaccinated. It's just like they just don't wind up very sick or hospitalized in the same number. So is the risk greater than zero? Absolutely. Would I like to see it lower? Absolutely. Um, is it an absolute value that's very high? No. Um, most kids are not nearly at the same level of risk as everybody else. But the problem is that lots of people are, you know, not totally incorrectly in the minds of like, well, we got everybody else vaccinated and they're safer now. And kids should have that same improved level of safety. And I agree. But kids are, you know, kids level of safety, even unvaccinated approximate some other groups who are vaccinated. So it's not something I'm, I would panic about, but I understand people's frustration and they, and their desire to get their kids to, you know, be even safer than sure. them. What do you make of the uh, Bill Maher, Ben Shapiro uh, rant and, and others as well that people ignore because of political correctness or whatever, uh, the issue of obesity when it comes to COVID, the vast majority of people, I don't know what numbers they say. I saw them say this percentage though, too, Jonathan uh, Leonhardt, who I know you like, and at New York Times, he trusts David a lot of Leonard. David, David Leonhardt, Leonhardt. Forgive me. Um, and he didn't really challenge it. I'm not sure if he I didn't know. But what what are your thoughts on that kind of? It's uh, why are we ignoring? I, I didn't. 
I'm not sure specifically what they said, but I don't think anybody's ignoring the fact that obesity was a risk factor. We've been saying that since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, it's one of the reasons that the CDC, it feels like when the CDC lists all the people or conditions that that are at a high risk, that's like every, it feels like tons of people. Because by the time you get through age and obesity and all kinds of mental health conditions, which are on their list and, you know, type one and type two diabetes and everything, like, Lots of Americans have a comorbid, you know, another, a second condition, which theoretically could place them at higher risk. And obesity is one of them. So are they upset we're not shaming people? Like, said, I, don't, se- I don't know se- what, what they're 78 percent of the people who died or were hospitalized were obese. And that's another one that's not a popular opinion to talk about. If you just said somebody, OK, there's an X factor in this. 78 percent of the people who get covid or die, die or go to the hospital. Wouldn't you be a little curious if you were a news organization? Wouldn't you be talking about that fact all the time? He said. But but I, this is where I mean, maybe I'm more plugged in than I was like. When has that been hidden? Like we we have been talking about that since the beginning of the pandemic. I can remember, you know, the, when we were talking about well, what puts people at higher risk in the months and like the first year of the pandemic, that came up all the time. Uh, I guess the I think sometimes is- people. I think I think. Look, I do think that that gets at some. You know, some people want to find like a blame, but we, you know, we've had this discussion. People do this all the time. Why does America healthcare system come up? Well, so many people are obese, and it's like that's not why healthcare costs so much. Right. It's true, true, unrelated. Um, If a significant number of people in hospitals in general are obese, if a significant number of Americans are obese, then they're going to comprise a decent number of the people who die. And, you know, just because that's how it is. And a lot of Americans are obese and a lot of Americans who are obese have other health conditions, all of which places them at higher risk for COVID. None of which means that COVID isn't killing them at a significantly higher rate than they would otherwise be, which makes COVID horrifically bad and something we should prevent. So I don't know. It's just like you just you just can't be like, oh, well, only obese people die. Therefore, we shouldn't care is a weird if, if that is what they're saying. That's that's it's a weird thing. I think it's, yeah, it's something that. like you should not be worried about getting COVID. Uh, you're not going to get that sick. You're not going to be hospitalized. You're not going to die. You're not fat, I but, guess. Uh, well, Again, it's like we're talking relative, not absolute risk. So you're at a higher risk. But if you're a thin, fit, 65, 70 year old who's unvaccinated, you're still at severe risk. Right. And should we not care about COVID? like this is a transmissible disease? You can't shut it down. It's not like heart disease where I can't give it to someone else. It's 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 there. It's out in the world. So to taking public health measures to prevent its transmission. There's lots of people who are at risk. Lots. Tons. Uh, well, I'll let you go, but I want to talk so much more about so many other things. I want to. I, I always feel like I want to ask you on this show uh, the answer to a question that you answered that you researched on your YouTube channel. But instead, you should just go watch it because it's one of those yeah, things where you need yeah. all of the all of the details, all of the nuance, whether it be an article or a video. There's a reason why can a low sugar diet starve cancer is five minutes and 30 seconds because you take a lot of time to explain things. So I'll just tease it. Yeah, And that's a good example though, of one where like, we're trying to make people feel better, like it release them from guilt and a burden. And still I'll get a lot of anger from people who are like, you're wrong. You're killing people. It's like, okay. Uh, because the sugar people's uh, views yeah, on some people hate sugar yeah. so much or, you know, they want to find a reason to blame cancer like that person ate too much sugar. And it's like that's that's not how this stuff works. Oh, it's such a what is it called when someone dies of a disease and you want to show nothing but empathy, but you also want to know about how they live their life. So <laughs> what's that? You know, called? That, that's what that's exactly what it, it's like. I don't know if there's a term. I'm not sure what it is, but it's like almost that moralizing. It's that it's that need to find a reason for it yeah. so that it doesn't affect you. Look, I think that happened with COVID, too. I mean, I think it's why, you know, a lot of people when they finally do get COVID are just like absolutely horrified because they really convinced themselves that it was almost a moral failing that that's why other people got it at the beginning and they weren't doing the right things. You have not gotten it. As far as I know, I've not gotten it. Right. Anyway. Like, look, Noah had it and we like tested and none of us had it, but yeah. you know, I wasn't serially testing myself every day. Is it possible? I got some clinically, 
you know, infected and like, you know, in and out in two days. No, only had it for like two days. It's it, I don't know. But no, I have not had COVID. That I know. Is there any research that says some people are like immune to a certain type of virus? Like they just can't get it. They just can't contract it. Mm, it's possible. But I think the more likely scenario, I mean, I've been vaccinated and boosted, which probably yeah. protects me quite a bit. And if I've been in, you know, if I've been like exposed, which provided perhaps another boosterish type dose, but didn't get infected because, you know, infection is a spectrum. Everybody thinks it's binary. It's like, maybe I got it and my body saw it and like beat it off in 12 hours and it never really took root. Am I, did I get COVID or did my body fight it off? I don't know. It's like, it's a range. So I, again, but if we're, if, the, if we're saying like you got COVID, you knew you had it, you were sick, and blah, I'm like, no, no, never had it. What about, is there any truth? I read the, just the abstract to this study from the New New England Journal of Medicine that said people who are really physically attractive don't get it. And maybe that's why you and I haven't gotten it. Do you, okay. think, there's, do you think there's any? Well, maybe that's why I haven't gotten it. I don't know about it. You and I both haven't gotten it. And we're both, how dare you? Well, maybe baldness prevents it too. I don't know. I think prevents a lot. I think it prevents a lot of things maybe. probably. All maybe. those chemicals that you use that you put in your hair. I don't, I'm not subjected to those. That maybe that's what it is. I don't know. <laughs> all, be those, surprised. all those chemicals. I, I, I have no idea. It's fascinating too because a couple of people at work are like still like waiting, I think, for me to get it. And I'm like, oh, really? Like, yeah, just, well, they just they can't fathom like how a lot of people have gotten COVID. Like it's yeah. just, you know, it's, if you're, and it just, yeah, somehow still no. Yeah, well, we will see. And I appreciate uh, your time today as always. And um, I'm going to invite you to episode 600 of Stand Up is coming up. And I want oh, yeah. you I want to, to, to make a cameo at one of our hangouts. So 600. That's amazing, man. Quite a lot of work. Yeah. Good job. Couldn't have done it without you, buddy. You were on number one. Yes. Number episode Super. number one. I, I'm just so thrilled. That's all. 600. That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, All right. So I hope to see you then. And thank you very much, pal. Anytime. Okay, there he goes. Dr. Aaron E. Carroll, ladies and gentlemen, as always, go follow him on Twitter. Let him know that you heard him here on the show. Never gets old. And please do the same for my next guest, because this is his first time joining me on the show. He is a veteran journalist, print his entire career. He's a print journalist. He's an author. He's the retired managing editor of Stars and Stripes. He's a Navy veteran. His Twitter bio reads, you don't get into journalism to find both sides. You get into journalism to find the truth, and you can find him at enoughalreadynow.com enoughalreadynow.com and follow him on Twitter at Earl of Enough. It's Earl Stevens, who I discovered based on this Twitter thread about the two journalists, the New York Times writers who just came out with a book where they released all this information about Kevin McCarthy in the book and not in the newspaper. And I want to read that Twitter thread to you, and then I will play my conversation with the guy who went viral for it. He writes, just so you know, 99% of the print journalists out there are disgusted by what these New York Times reporters are pulling with this fucking book deal. I know folks are plenty fed up with journalism in this country, and I get it. So a quick defense and a scolding. What these New York Times reporters pulled with this Kevin McCarthy scoop is not taught anywhere, and it is certainly not practiced in any of the newsrooms I am familiar with. Print journalists are taught and reminded again and again that they work for one person, the reader. Every decision that is made in the newsroom should consider only one thing. How will this decision affect our readers who trust us and pay our salaries? Print journalist jobs are to be where readers can't and report out to them what is happening on their beat or they're in their coverage area, whether it be schools, politics, sports, etc. The reader trusts them to do this. The reader does not pay them to sit on news. Before going further, I want to point out there are two different types of journalism books. One is the book which is written to describe the context behind a significant news event or the scope of one's beat. That book is fine. As a print vet, I devour them. The other is the book that has new information in it that they've never shown to the readers again. The readers who they work for. This book is not okay. But in the past decade or so, has become a staple of papers like the New York Times and Washington Post. This book is being cobbled together with editorial leadership at these papers who are putting profit before their readers. They are serving themselves, not their readers. And it makes me sick. It makes most journalists sick. And it makes you sick. 
I grudgingly turned into the Maddow show, tuned into the Maddow show last night while she helped these reporters pad their pockets and break news at the expense of their readers. Ooh, it was great TV. And they seem so fucking pleased with themselves. Look what we've known all along and you didn't. Ladies and gentlemen, my conversation with the guy who wrote all that, Earl Stevens, right now. A real life print journalist. It's an honor to have you on, Earl. Thank you for joining me for the first time on the show. Pete, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I, I just want to introduce you and your your career, your work uh, to the people, because I think uh, folks who have done what you have done have a wealth of knowledge and experience and credibility to share as print journalists. So talk to me a little bit about your career and, and how you got into it. I mean, what where did you grow up that made you want to be a, a journalist? What was the catalyst for that? Yeah, well, I, I as I told you a few minutes ago, I grew up in Plainfield, New Jersey, and, and I grew up at a time when newspapers were king, and uh, we read one in the morning, and we had another one delivered in the afternoon, which, quite frankly, I ended up delivering in the afternoon, and I uh, I uh, just read voraciously, and mostly sports, you know, that, that was the hook to get people in the newspapers, especially a young kid like myself, and read about the Mets and the Yankees and uh, Giants and all that, and just you know, just loved them. There, all the information was right there, right? And it was just the coolest thing. And then it turns out they were paying people to work at those places, you know, and like, well, holy hell, what a, what a, what a job that would be. So I, uh, you know, it's the old cliche when you find out you really can't play the sport to make any money doing them. You say, well, maybe the next best thing would be to cover them and write about them. And so, uh, that was kind of where I got interested in, in newspapering. And then many years later, I, uh, I uh, started on my way and worked at a bunch of dailies. A bunch of dailies such as? Yeah. So I, uh, I, I really started making my way when I escaped New Jersey. And, and I say that I, I love Jersey. Don't get me wrong. You know, I mean, you know, you got to have a sense of humor to live in a place. And I truly do love the place. But you can't really break into a newspaper of any repute in New Jersey just because that's where everybody goes after they've broken in, if you will. So I went down to Florida. And uh, worked at the Fort Myers News Press on the southwestern side. And then I worked at the Naples Daily News a little farther to the south. And then I did something completely ridiculous, which I do a lot of in my life. I went to a, a paper in Maine, uh, this, the Lewis and Sun Journal, where I was the sports editor there for a, a long time. And then finally, I uh, took the job as a managing editor at Stars and Stripes in Washington, D.C., and then eventually on over to Europe. How how long did you work in Maine? And you were the you ran basically the sports page, the sports section for the Lewiston yeah, newspaper. Yeah, that would have been from ninety. Well, I got there ninety two. I took a sports editor job a couple of years later, so it'd been ninety four to ninety eight. I uh, I edited the sports section of the paper up there. But you lived in Maine for like six years. Yeah, yeah. A whole different. Great state. Old as hell, but great state, man. Yeah. Uh, would you care to uh, characterize the people? Would you care to generalize about the people or is that not fair to Mainers? You know what? The one, well, not the one beautiful thing, a beautiful thing about Mainers is you cannot do that. Um, that is a really diverse place. Now it's all white. So I'm not talking about it's diversity in thought. Right. Yeah. And so you have pockets throughout Maine that, that it's, it's tribal, man. And you can have very liberal pockets in Maine, very conservative pockets in Maine. Blue collar pocket pockets, you know, white collar pockets. Um, you cannot generalize Mainers. Just look at look at who they're saying. I mean, Angus King's an independent, right? Yeah, you yeah. Know? Not great answer. So, uh, yeah. So in your career, I mean, you were ex pr pretty much exclusively a print journalist all this time. Yeah. You were a you were a reporter, a beat reporter, uh, uh, a muckraker. You were an editor, of course, and. You know, you you. I'm sure you could have done other things within the industry, uh, but you stayed a print journalist that whole time. Yeah. Right. That's because I'm ornery. You know, it was, there was, look, there was a, there was something to be, there's something about being a print reporter versus TV, which was the big competition at the time. There, there was a thought and the TV folks will hate me for saying it probably. And, but there was a thought you were lowering yourself. It was cheap. You know, it was, it wasn't about the news so much. It was just about, getting people to see you. And I did have a TV show at one point, though. I should plug that. Oh, you it did was, sell out. 
What's that? You did sell out. What was your I team? Sold, I sold out. I did a little bit. I uh, When I was a sports editor up in Maine, we uh, we worked with the 27, the uh, ABC affiliate up there, and we did a sports show uh, every Sunday night. And and I'll tell you something, man. It, it's scary how many people were up at 1120 on a Sunday night watching that shit. I mean, it was crazy. I, you know? I could see, I could absolutely see that. I've got a lot of thoughts about late night programming, and and I've been involved with it over the years, and and so yeah, and right. you know, but 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 doing a sports TV show is is not exactly selling out uh, if you're a print journalist because, and I hear what you're saying, and, and certainly as a comedian, there's all kinds of parallels where if you go do this, you're a sellout, and you could say that about any, any number of industries. But I right. mean, it just that's what I wanted to talk with you about print journalism and why it matters because well, of so many different reasons, but I want to just get your perspective on how much changed in the industry over your career. Cause it would seem like it was gradual. There was the, the, the golden age of, of print of newspapers for sure. And I'm not yeah. sure what you'd call where we're at now. There's a lot of good journalism being done in print, but obviously the entire industry has changed. How much changed over your career from the little, the smaller markets to the larger markets that you worked in? Wow. Um, that's a show unto itself. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best with that one. Uh, you know, the, the answer to your question is a heck of a lot. Okay. Um, obviously the internet, you know, the internet just changed everything. We, we still don't understand how much the internet changed everything in every facet of our lives. Who, who could have predicted 15 years ago, people would be looking at their phones all of the time, right? Um, it, it just wasn't even it, looking at your phone. Your phone takes pictures. I mean, this is, it's crazy, man. You know, so it, again, it, a lot, you know, there is the, the competition when I was in newspapering in the eighties and the nineties into the two thousands, et cetera, was was TV and they had their niche and we had our niche and uh, and then and then TV got into the twenty four hour news cycle right and that's what that's the other thing that really kind of started changing a lot is yeah. all of a sudden there was breaking news every minute you know that's the other thing that if you turn on CNN or God forbid Fox or MSNBC right now they're going to have something that says breaking news on it even if it's not that's another story right but it's all breaking news now and it's all coming at you fast so people were in the habit well, I'm not going to wait. 24 hours for my newspaper, I'll just turn on the TV and get all the breaking news right. and inhale all that. And that's all I need. You know, a veteran, so, a veteran print journalist like yourself, the way to torture someone like you is to follow you around with the, the breaking news sound effect. Yeah. Yeah, man. Just I the, mean, come on already. The yeah. drums, whatever the orchestra is, <laughs> just like, oh, yeah. we've got something. It's yeah. Yeah. Right. It's exactly. from two yeah, days breaking, ago. Breaking. The sun came up today. Breaking. Well, it's it would. Breaking. It would seem that the the thing, that one of the most important things that changed was the funding mechanism of right. of media and journalism in general. And print used to be ads, including personal ads, which I guess generated a, a good amount of money. You, you would take out your job uh, searching ads, uh, but it was mostly that. But then there's a question of the the, the moral question of uh, about profit. You know, how does a newspaper make money and pay everybody that works there? And we can get into, you know, what TV and radio and the Internet has done. But how much of that part changed in terms of the funding of print journalism? Yeah, that's such a good observation, man. You know, classifieds is what you're talking about. Uh, that's and, what I meant. Yeah, classifieds. Yeah, right. And so the classified section, that's where we found our jobs and that's where we found pets and we found, you know, old lawnmowers and stuff like this. And so... They they provided so much revenue to the newspaper business, and and almost overnight that was gone, you know, with with the internet gone. So you're talking millions of dollars that that newspapers just flat lost. So that that was huge, man. You know, that was you know we we deal in newspapers something called news hole, right? And the news hole is how how much space do you have to put news into the newspaper? And if you look at, you know, watch a movie, even in the 70s, and there's these big, beautiful broadsheets, you know, big, beautiful papers are so huge and everybody's reading them. And as the years went by, the newspapers literally shrunk, you know, it got smaller and smaller and smaller to the point now, you know, like my, I take the paper here, obviously, because I'm, I'll do that until I die. But it's, it's semi embarrassing how small it's gotten, you know, it's, it's sad. It's just, it's incredibly sad to me. And I, and I, I just think it's killing us as a society. 
it's it's, it's hard well, to, to sometimes too when when there's an issue where there's not a person or a real cause to blame because you know you look at the funding of of newspapers and the great journalists and editors that put it together each and every day. My grandfather worked at the Syracuse Herald Journal. He's a print setter, right. and right. and uh, th- all their jobs went away because all the revenue went away. But whose fault? It was the internet. The internet was invented and it kind of defunded print journalism in a huge way. And then obviously we can talk about big corporations and consolidation and individual billionaires now buying newspapers. But I mean, is there any one to blame? Can you look at Europe? Can you look at Asia or anywhere else and say, you know, other societies, other countries are doing it better. They have different laws. They have different funding mechanisms. Or is it kind of, hey, the Internet created a a new world? Uh, Bam. Good questions. Um, So. Yes. I mean, other countries, you know, I I lived in Europe for a while and papers, they're not they don't they're not in their heyday like they were. But they're they're still doing better, say, in Germany and France and England than they are here. Um, And I'll just posit two reasons for that. And I don't know if they're right or not, but there'd be my guess. One was that I think that they embrace the Internet as newspapers a lot faster than American newspapers did. And I can tell you, I was as guilty as anybody when the internet came along saying stuff, Oh, no one's going to read that crap. You know, they're going to go to their paper really being stupid and stubborn, you know? Um, And so I think that other countries did better with that. And that, and now I'll just be blunt about it too, man. I just think that, they have better education systems over there where people still read, yeah, you know, yeah, and they yeah. plow in and, and they, they want the whole story, not just one or two inches of it. Right. And, and I know that's a, a really vast generalization, but I'll, I'll stand by it. I just think that, you know, our schools are failing over here, our education system. Yeah. It's a great way of putting it. They want the whole story, not just one or two inches of it, because the story can be an actual column. I mean, you're talking about the physical uh, length uh, when you see a, a, an article or it could be many full page of, uh, pages in, in a magazine or a newspaper if it's investigative journalism. And I don't know, I've just learned this lesson throughout my career in, in, in public media, you know, talking to microphones that, boy, you better get as much context as you can on a situation. You better really learn from experts and, and who have good sources before you react or else, you know, you'll your reputation will be tarnished now. It's not necessarily true because some of the people who have the biggest followings in the country are complete assholes and dishonest losers. But I, you know, want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and and, and feel like I'm being a moral person if I'm talking to any audience, big or small. So how do you explain, Like, how do you generally approach that discussion, Earl, about we need, whether it's in a newspaper or magazine or on the Internet, we need to read a full article on the issue of the current day issue of immigration or any number of uh, TikTok between world leaders. Why does that matter for, uh, let me make it as big as I can for civil society. Yeah. Why does that matter? Well, I mean, how do you do it is one, one question Fair I enough. heard there. How do, you, how do you do it? And man, I, I wish I had the answer right. to that question. It's, I don't know that we're ever going to get it back. That's the scary part to me. You know, I, I kind of thought maybe for whatever reason, five or 10 years ago, people were kind of maybe getting a little tired of it. And, you know, you know, we really need to dig into a newspaper every day. It'd be good for us. And it, that's just not happening. Do you, do you know, Pete, I, I'm the only one that I'm aware of on my street that even takes a daily newspaper. anymore. And, and I can tell you when we, we moved here 10 years ago, it was probably 50 50, right? So just in those 10 years, the newspapers are, are going away, you know, mm-hmm. and, and some of them, some of very few are, are finding a nice niche online um, and, and putting out some pretty good local news. But I'm not sure there's a one of them that would say that they're making any real money doing it. And, and that's a huge problem. So we're not going to solve the way to, to fund great journalism and, and no one seems to have you know great answers. And we can talk about what your thoughts are on, you know, Substack and Patreon and that kind of funding. 
But mm-hmm. I wanted to, to, to just talk right now about current day print journalism and where we are at right now with the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, Chicago Tribune, whatever newspapers, local newspapers still remain in USA Today. And I just want to ask you real quick, and you'll probably dispense of this and be deeply offended by the question, or maybe you'll surprise me and say it's not much of a difference. The difference between, say, the New York Times and an MSNBC hour, or if you want a Fox or, or CNN hour, isn't print journalism still much more detailed and nuanced than you will get in most hours of television, much less even radio? Oh, man, yes. Um, I, unbelievable. Look, I, I went off pretty hard on the New York Times over the weekend with that damn book of theirs, the latest book. And, and so um, we can talk about that off to the side if you want. But if you were to go into, the, I'll just take the Times website right now and look at what they're doing on the environmental issues, political issues, even local issues, you know, in your part to New York City, um, entertainment, arts. It's, it's second to none. It's amazing reporting. It's beautifully written, generally. The stuff they're doing with graphics now to support it is mind-boggling. It's never been better, right? And, and so, I, you know, I just inhale that stuff. Yeah. I, I'm amazed by it. Yeah. You know? I, I, that's why it just pisses me off when they pull this crap of these books, because you're just tarnishing what should be a, a really stellar image. Okay, so let's talk about that because you brought it up. Uh, <laughs> what is what is wrong with? I've read your 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 thread, so people have the context there. But I want to ask you specific questions about it. Um, what is wrong yeah. with a, a print journalist who is employed by the New York Times, saving a detail about something that uh, one of the most influential politicians said to them about a very important event, saving that for a book? that comes out months later. What's wrong with that? Why is that so problematic? Well, the, the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, the one word answers everything. And then I'll break that down a little bit, <laughs> okay. right? You, you, work at a, you work in a newspaper, you know? And so you go to work um, for the readers, which I pounded home hard. You know, I, I, I worked for a guy named Dave Mazzarella. I, I'll drop Dave's name here. Dave was the editor of USA Today when it had its heyday. You know, Dave is the smartest newspaper guy as I've ever worked for. And I had the pleasure when I was a managing editor at working for him at Stars and Stripes. And I, Dave's just, you know, you know, he drenches himself in ink. The guy is a newspaper man. And he, anytime we had a rough discussion, you know, in a budget meeting, I'm talking about a news budget meeting, he'd say, all right, well, what are our readers going to think about that? Right. And you bring it back to the readers every time, Pete. And so if you're going to sit here and tell me that you're working some beat, you're working at a newspaper that I subscribe to, and you get some information, and you don't think I need to know it for several months or until ever the fuck, excuse me, whenever you think I need to know it, I'm going to take great offense with that. That's not news. That's narcissism, man. That's, you know, it, it makes me so angry. And, it's, and we're seeing more and more, even guys like Woodward, right? Great reporter. But they're doing stuff like this. Right. And who's it serving? Who is it serving? Well, he doesn't have enough money. <laughs> and his defense, I would just say he, he's got a lot of overhead, I bet. Yeah. Got to keep, right. yes. keep it going. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's just abhorrent to me, you know? And the thing that I tried to bring home is it's abhorrent to most journalists. Mm. You know, you've got some 27-year-old city editor 40 miles from here, some small town newspaper making $31,000 a year, busting her tail to get the news out to her readers. And she's not thinking about a book and sitting on this and sitting on that. She's, she's doing her job to, to, to make sure that, you know, they're talking truth to power. They're in the city halls. They're in the school board meetings, which we talked about a little bit. And they're covering this stuff because you know why? Because the readers deserve it. They need to know. It's news, man. It's important. Uh, I just say it's in the public's interest. It's in your yeah. it's in your interest to know these things. That's how I've always thought about every topic and every guest. Is this in people's interest? Uh, not cool. just human interest of someone's fascinating story. That's fine, too. But like in these big issues, don't you want to know? That your water, your water has shit in it. Like I, we should, yeah. we should have people that report that. Uh, but uh, you know, 
I haven't seen um, these two New York Times reporters, Martin and, and, and Burns, respond to it. You, you, you even took Rachel Maddow to task, which I really agreed with because, you know, they she has them on. And by the way, she's quitting doing one day a week and making thirty million dollars, which infuriates me. But we're, yeah. we're, especially since my friend Ali Velshi, I guarantee, isn't making that, and he's been just doing a bang up job in her, in her stead. But anyway, like, Agreed. there's a problem with her then saying "great job." There's a problem with other media kind of encouraging it. It creates this supportive environment of save this detail for your book, make a whole bunch of money by selling this. I mean, because that's how it's sold, right? To the publisher, we're going to have all these things. These are going to be these explosive details. I mean, yeah. they they sell books to the publisher based on how they will be promoted. I know that. Yeah, that's right. Well, so in, in Maddow's case, look, she can spin a story. She she does a great job, right? She, But I, I you know, she she has a show. It's a show, yeah. right? And so it's about yeah. ratings. Yeah. And, and what better way to get ratings than just to sit there and brag you're going to get two alleged newsmen who hold news and break it on your show, you know? And so... I, I like her okay. I think she's extraordinarily smart, but I, yeah, it's like this cabal, man, you know, and, and well, we're the ones that suffer for it. The, I don't know. I, my criticism of her specifically and others like her, uh, and I want to get your response as a print journalist, is there was there's far too much of I'm just asking questions and I'm connecting these dots. These two people were in the same place. I'm just asking questions. These are important things. Watch this space. I don't feel like newspaper or print journalists write, this is a good question that we're asking here. They generally, as you have written about, they they seek out the facts. They don't have an agenda. They don't have a bias. And then they print that. They don't if they don't have the story, they don't just say, I'm just asking questions. That's my criticism. I mean, she's not even comparable to her peers in the same time slots, you know, on Fox. Don't get me wrong. They do something like that, too. But it still doesn't seem like responsible to me. No, it, of course, it's not. Um, and again, I just draw the distinction. It's just completely two different things. It's, yeah. it's just a giraffe and, a, and a, a fly or something. I mean, they're just she's her her job is not what I would say a news person's job is right as someone who walks into a newspaper every day and you go what the hell's going to happen today you have no you live you know that was the beauty of the business right i mean you'd walk into it and you never knew what was going to happen and every day you produce this this report on what happened and then you'd start again and you do the next day i mean by the way how cool is that i mean that is just the most awesome job you could ever want to I, I I think so. It sounds like it sounds like a great job. Sounds like a lot of stress because of all the deadlines and everything. And, and you know, the um, sometimes obviously the subject matter, certainly if you're a conflict reporter. But tell me, regardless, if you wouldn't mind with with chasing down a story or anything that you want to share about that you covered in your career that you're proud of. That's interesting. It's important. Oh, so many, so many things I was involved with. And, I, you know, I don't. Maybe, Me to shirt off because it's always a team effort, right? Well, it's, yeah, but, but and I'm not asking necessarily to just sit here and 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 wallow yeah. in your own celebrate. You celebrate your career. I'm asking maybe if you can give the answer with like how you did the story. Like you went and you chased down leads and you talked to people, and sometimes people lied to you, and sometimes the story, you know they said different things. I'm sure that and and for you to have to you know seek out the truth must have been really that that's challenging work. That's what I'm asking. I guess a story like yeah, that, right? It was all about getting it right, you know. And, and the other thing is that, you know, and, and I'm not saying this didn't go on because it did, you know, getting it first, being first, especially back, really back in the heydays when you had two newspaper and three newspaper towns and everybody was in competition with each other to get the story, which was awesome, right? But you had to be really careful you didn't fuck it up and, right. and, and get something sure. wrong. And so it was all about making that extra phone call, not to be corny, you know, verify, check, verify, check, verify, check. Um, if you were lucky, you had a great editor or two or even three that would go through these things, say, what about this? What about this? Yeah. You know, I hope people can appreciate or they, they will after hearing this, just how much how careful we were to make sure that we got it right. You know, because once you start getting stuff wrong, your credibility goes. And guess what? When your credibility goes, man, you're done. It's like you're done. Well, and you can't. Hear it. I mean, do you still think that? No, we it used to be that if you yeah. made up a source or you plagiarized or you yeah. didn't corroborate your story, you were yeah. done. But yeah. it seems in journalism now, 
uh, you actually, your credibility isn't compromised if you get a lot wrong too often, it would seem. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, that, it's, that's a horribly good observation, man. Yeah. You know, because it just isn't, it just isn't that way anymore. But also, you don't have the number of newspapers. You don't have the number of people that are going to newspapers for their sources right now, right? So they're going on TV. Someone says something idiotic one hour, and the next hour, up. Oh, sorry, I had that wrong, moving right along. You know, um, it's just such a different environment. And some people double down on it. You yeah, know, like, the, it just made me think one of the things, the most horrific type of malpractice that sometimes occurs is that in uh, there's, you know, war crimes, there's torture or murder or rape happening. And how do you prove that that that's happening? And how do you prove who is doing it? And in America, you have even on the I don't know what you would call the far left. There's guys like Jimmy Dore and Glenn, Glenn Greenwald and Max. Uh, what's his name? Um uh, I forget his name, but it's basically saying that these things didn't happen. And then you've got Russian and Ukrainian journalists saying, I'm documenting it here. I'm here doing it, documenting, speaking a language and saying it. But like, that's a really bad thing to get wrong or misrepresent. And yet uh, it has to be done. It's the most important kind of journalism, I would imagine. Yeah, of course it does. You know, I, you know, like Greenwald and stuff like that, I, I don't know what's going on with that guy. You yeah. know, I, I am here to say that, you know, I didn't work at every newspaper. I didn't work at most newspapers, but every newspaper I did work at, you know, you hear, oh, it's the, lib- the liberal media or whatever. No, you know, I'm not going to say everybody did. They we all have our opinions. I'm not going to sit here and say that. But there was never one single instance in my life where I saw anything like that in a newsroom because that person would have been thrown out on her ear. Right. You know, you're there to get the story, yeah. get it right and get it out for the readers. That's uh, it. That's I, I, it. I'd love to keep talking to you about this and other things, your career and everything. But my final question today, I guess I, I just want to just, you know, one of the biggest problems I see. And I've talked about this with with journalists and and, and professors of journalism and and media critics for a long time. And obviously, I'm sure you have strong opinions on this is the death of local journalism, which, of course, you've already talked about being a part of. It's almost impossible to fund to make money doing it, to covering the board of education, the town yeah. council, uh, and then the TV, local TV is news is fucking reprehensible because it's so horrible to anybody who might belong to a group that that murderer belongs to. Because now you're all like, it's just all murder and child death and. I mean, even like Lester Holt on the nightly news I saw did a follow up story on that on that kid who tragically fell out of a ride at an amusement park. And I'm like, I don't think we needed a follow up story with the three minutes you had remaining on that. I don't yeah. think that was in the public's interest. I think that's a horrible tragedy. And I'm not sure that we needed to, 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 to cover that on tonight's edition. But I'm not the editor there. But my, but about local news and, and its importance yeah. is my question. Sorry for rambling on. No, that's all right. I Go ahead, man. I like the rant. I agree with you. So, look, I, I, I say something along the lines that the death of local newspapers has led to a rise in ignorance in America. And there's yeah. my cat. Yeah. Oh, it's your not. cat just walked across the screen. How it lovely. Was. What do you That's got? Monkey the cat. Monkey the cat. She's oh, a good hi, monkey. So, um, thanks, Monk. Um, so, th- I really believe that it has been injurious losing these local newspapers in our in our communities. And I hate to bring this guy's name up because he's such an asshole. But Elon Musk, right? And so you've got all this money, dude. If you want to really, really do some good for this country or, yeah. or anybody of his ilk that has that money. Invest in local newspapers. Bring local newspapers back in some form, right? You've got to have people in these school board meetings. You have to have people out there in the ball fields covering sports. You have to have people in City Hall bringing the news home to the readers, representing them, right? That's not happening. And this is why, you know, in no secret, I'm, I'm, I'm very far to the left politically these days. It wasn't always that way. That's another story. So that's that's why Republicans are running roughshod. There's no one to call them to account. Right. There's no one there to ask them, wait a minute, why are you doing that? You know, how are you getting away with that? No one's no one's there. No one's there. In the it's local. Too- yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm watching it happen in my community and it's just been flabbergasting. I mean, I had to get involved with a local NBC news reporter. I, I, I think I convinced her, I think, to 
well, I know I did to to kill a story because it was not remotely accurate, not even remotely accurate. I couldn't believe she, she was going with it, but she was going to go with it. And if she had, it would have done tremendous damage to what was left of the social fabric of my community. And it didn't matter. It didn't. It just didn't matter because that was the way this person. That's the way that they function in these certainly in these local affiliates. It's, yeah, it's just terrible. I see it too, man. I, it's, I, again, I don't know what the answer is, but boy, if I had a lot of money, I'd know where I put but, it. But would it matter that, you know, I mean, cause Bezos is a billionaire and he bought the Washington post. What do you think of that? I didn't like it. I don't know that I've noticed any difference in their coverage. However, um, uh, if, if there has been, I really haven't paid attention to it. When I lived in, in DC for a while, I used to love the post, you know, it was a, was and is a really good newspaper. So I can't say that I've seen a lot of it. I, you know, I'm out of my depth on that one. I had not work there, but I didn't, I didn't notice any difference. I think really. it's weird that they, they now that the, when you get the Washington post deliver the, uh, the dead tree version, it's shaped like a dick, like much like his rockets. I, I feel like that. I'm surprised you haven't noticed that, but whatever. <laughs> you're, like you said, you're not paying that close attention. I think that no. seemed to be coming from the top. I can't. Uh, All right. That joke is beneath you. It's not beneath me. I really appreciate your time. And uh, I really have a great deal of respect for you and your career and and that of your colleagues. I hope that we can pick up where we left off. I'd love to know about how you've changed politically and and learn more about your career. I think uh, people like you are legends and and can mentor a lot of young journalists. And that's super important. So I hope you'll keep writing and and, and keep talking to me. Well, Pete, I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been fun. All right, that is Earl Stevens, the first time on the show. I hope you appreciated that. I hope you will go say hi to him on Twitter. That means so much, at Earl of Enough, at Earl of Enough. Please, if you enjoyed that conversation, let him know. His website, enoughalready.com, where he now posts a lot. Got a, a big following on Twitter, so follow him there. And that is all I've got for you, Earl Stevens. And Aaron Carroll, thank you very much. Pete Coe, thank you very much. John Carroll, thank you very much for singing us in and out every day. I hope to see you at tomorrow night's Hangout. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, standupwithpete.com and go over to truebill.com slash standupwithpete and save a whole bunch of money on unwanted subscriptions. I love you guys. Go out there and be the change you want to see. And I will talk to you tomorrow.